Flagstaff City Council amending the Flagstaff Regional Plan 2030 to change the place type designation within a future suburban activity center, S16, from neighborhood scale to regional scale on maps 21, 22, and 24. Move the center point of a future suburban activity center, S16, north and east on maps 21, 22, and 24. Change the area type designation on map 21 and 22 from area in white and existing rural future suburban to existing employment for approximately 28 acres. And realign a future circulation road corridor on map 25, generally located at 1120 West Purple Sage Trail, providing for severability and establishing an effective date. Uh, before we get started, I will need to be recusing myself from this uh, due to a conflict of interest, and we'll be handing this over to Vice Mayor Sweet for the conduct of the meeting. Uh, but we'll return upon the conclusion to continue the agenda. Due to the timing, Vice Mayor, I think maybe if we could, you know, take a break right afterward, then it would be a suitable time for uh, coming back. So, as suggested, but... It, it is up to you. I think that so. sounds like a plan. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. I will now open the public hearing. Tiffany, take it away. Thank Actually, you. Vice Mayor, if I may, I, I did Please. put a, a C in the chat. I just wanted to remind everybody with the, the public hearing um, procedures that are in uh, the rules of procedures. Uh, it's specifically Rule 9.02A through F. Um, the chair will be announcing uh, and going through the, the order in which we follow the, the public hearing procedures. So thank you for that. I appreciate it, Vice Mayor. Thank you. And another housekeeping um, request by myself, if my colleagues can please put a C or a Q in the chat box so I know who to call on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vice Mayor and Council Tiffany Antall, Zoning Code Manager, here tonight to present a minor regional plan amendment. Um, the mayor did a great job of just listing off what all of the uh, proposals are or the amendments that are proposed tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into the meat of the matter. Uh, this is the subject property. It is approximately 172.6 acres, which currently consists of about 17 different tax parcels. Um, the proposed development is eventually a 1.26 million square foot hospital and medical offices. Right now, the initial first phase of that hospital is about seven, around the 750,000 mark with a, an, um, an ACC or ambulatory, ambulatory care center around 250,000 square feet. Um, eventually, there are um, phase two of this development includes potentially other um, developments, including 315 residential dwelling units as part of mixed use development and other non residential uses, including retail and lodging, as well as research and development uses, um, and of course, approximately 31 acres of open space. So I'll dig into each one of the pieces of this amendment. And the first step is, is that we're changing the place type designation within a future suburban activity center from neighborhood scale to regional scale, and we're relocating that activity center. So here's two amendments, one slide. Um, so the place types, which are designated in our regional plan, are those um, areas that are la labeled as activity centers or corridors or neighborhoods. And these areas provide the framework for density and intensity of mix of uses uh, within those areas. Activity centers are mixed use areas where there is a concentration of commercial and other land uses, typically defined by a pedestrian shed. The pedestrian shed is that larger quarter mile circle around the centroid um, of the activity center. In this case, there's a neighborhood suburban activity center, um, and these are intended to be smaller mixed-use centers at the intersection of collector streets and neighborhood access roads. So the big difference here is a regional suburban activity center is located, they're larger mixed-use centers located at the intersection of arterial roads. This particular activity center has always been designated at the intersection of two arterial roads, which is basically the future alignment of Woody Mountain Road and the future alignment of Beulah Boulevard. Um, in that realm, it meets the standards for um, converting this activity center from 
neighborhood to scale to a regional scale just based on the level of roads and the intersections that it exists at. Um, additionally, the applicant is proposing to realign this activity center. So as we get further into this request, you'll see that we're looking at changing the roadway corridors within the regional plan to support the alignment or the shape of the future hospital site. Um, they're taking that activity center and moving it closer to where the new intersection of what would be Woody Mountain Road and Beulah Boulevard um, and placing it directly over that hospital site. And that places that ped shed over a bulk of the overall planning area, not just the hospital itself, um, but it helps us focus that activity center closer on where we know will be the hospital being the hub of this activity center. The next one is um, we're amending map 21 and 22 to designate areas within the south portion of the activity center as an employment area. So right now we have area in white. We have future or we have existing rural and future suburban. Area in white is sort of a, ca a category that was applied to lands that fell under government ownership. Um, and I think that because this parcel is so close to Fort Tuthill that that could be why, as you'll see that Fort Tuthill is area in white. The map isn't meant to be perfect. It's not to meant to be a parcel by parcel map. So we've done cleanup over the time um, in regards to these areas in white. Um, so the proposal here, as you'll see, is that area that's shaded dark gray is to put that in the employment category. Employment is a category we've lost overall in terms of the regional plan. It's also the most protected in terms of the regional plan. To take land outside of the employment category requires a major regional plan amendment. And in this case, um, adding this will support future rezonings that will add employment opportunities into our community. Uh, and lastly, we're proposed, the NAH is proposing to amend map 25 to realign a future road corridor. So as sort of previously discussed, um, you can see here, this is the existing uh, regional plan. Beulah was intended to be realigned, um, move further away from its existing alignment. It would then run along the boundary of Fort Hut Hill and connect here at Woody Mountain. A lot of this planning work was done many years ago, several, almost uh, two decades ago, um, in regards to a large master plan residential community. Um, and really the realignment and the, concur the continuing of this within our existing regional plan and in other planning documents is because the regional plan shows what is an ultimately will be an underpass under I-17. Um, so this is another way to alleviate the movement of transportation and tra traffic um, in an area that is already becoming tight with the existing two-lane bridge um, at John Wesley Powell. So in this case, um, the intersection was moved in order to accomplish grade. In working with the applicant, we don't have final design of an intersection, but they are confident that they can make that work um, in accordance with design parameters. So this, um, in order to approve a rezoning in the future, um, a rezoning would have to show that that intersection will work with the future underpass in order to meet the findings of compliance with the regional plan. And lastly, the findings. Um, so I'll go through the findings really quickly. The first one is compliance with the regional plan. Uh, there really is, that is the basic finding, is that this, these particular amendments are in conformance with the goals and policies of the regional plan itself. Um, first off, look, taking a look at the vision that the greater Flagstaff community embraces the region's extraordinary culture and ecological setting on the Colorado Plateau through active stewardship of the natural and built environments. Residents and visitors encourage and advance intellectual, environmental, social, and economic vitality for today's citizens and future generations. These proposed amendments are in alignment with the vision of the overall regional plan. Um, specifically, there was a very detailed policy analysis provided. I, I won't have time tonight to go through all of those policies for you, but in addition to those goals and policies, there are particular standards provided in the regional plan, ones that help shape us and understand what should be within an activity center, what should be within a corridor, where corridors should be aligned, where activity centers should be located. 
And while the goals and policies are very broad, um, and it's easy to get into the weeds on the goals and policies in regards to the actual proposed development time, we're just focusing on the goals and policies in accordance with these particular amendments. Remember that these amendments do not grant the entitlements. An entitlement case will follow. That entitlement case of the rezoning in a specific plan will need to find conformance with these plan amendments as proposed, if approved. So there, what I can tell you is, is that there really hasn't been a private development request to modify a future activity center since the regional plan was adopted. Um, but I could see more coming down the, the lane. Uh, the mix of land use zoning types within designated activity centers has changed little from year to year. Um, the balance of zoning changes has come from um, specific plans or neighborhood plans, Southside, Plaza Vieja, mostly Southside. Um, but future changes to activity centers are still expected. I mean, that's the point of them being labeled. This one in, in this case is labeled future. We know it's future because it lacks the infrastructure to consider it existing. Um, and in order to make that activity center work, we have to work through all of those infrastructure components. So you may hear a lot of concerns tonight about where we're going in terms of the traffic impact analysis, water and sewer, um, environmental stewardship, all of those things are being worked through in terms of that entitlement process. This regional plan amendment helps us set the scene, helps us know that we're heading down the right path um, in, in terms of those future entitlement cases. And this, the relocation of this activity center does have the potential to approximately add about 63 acres of commercial space and 35 acres of public space if a zoning map amendment is approved. Uh, with this request. That's the first rezoning coming through. The second rezoning would be much larger. Um, and since the adoption of the regional plan, there has really been only one amendment increasing the employment area type. Um, and there have been, there's been one amendment converting approximately 36.5 acres. We, uh, that was on McMillan Mesa. There was a larger area. So we're building back um, and I, it seems like a good trade. We are, we've preserved McMillan Mesa, but we're adding back employment in an area that is close to arterial roadways and is close to a freeway interchange. Uh, the proposed amendment is supported by several of the goals and policies within the plan, and the proposed location is an ideal candidate for this amendment. Uh, the goals and policies listed above in your staff report um, support the finding of conformance with the regional plan and again, just talking about the road network, it's really all about for us being able to keep the possibility of that underpass in the future. Um, the applicant is not anticipating having to construct this underpass as part of their development. The applicant will need to ensure that it's possible. And in terms of the citizen participation plan, there are a lot of cases being reviewed all together. The, the neighborhood meetings and citizen participation plan have all occurred together in combination. So folks have been getting a lot of information. Um, there have been at least three official neighborhood meetings, although the applicant has held a lot more. Um, you were provided links to their um, citizen participation plan to date. Um, those meetings have been held throughout this last year, um, starting in January of last year and finishing up at the end of this year. The common themes of support included economic development impact, better access to care and new clinical services, and the overall health and wellness vision. And common themes of concern included transit and bus service, access to the new campus, traffic, reuse of the existing NIH campus, helicopter ambulance noise, and building height. And I will tell you that those are all details we will dive into in depth um, as we go through those entitlement processes in the future. And staff leaves the, the proposed amendment and the Planning and Zoning Commission recommended unanimously, 7-0, um, to recommend approval to this to the City Council. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, council. Let's wait on questions until after our presentation with NAH. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor Sweet and Council Members. My name is Josh Tinkle. I'm the Acting Chief Executive Officer for Northern Arizona Healthcare. And I presume we'll get a slide up here. Do we need to do this? There we go. As soon as that pulls up. There we are. Okay, we've got a presentation for you. We understand we have uh, 
10 minutes, so our, our pleasure to buzz through this pretty quick for everybody. Uh, just quick about Northern Arizona Healthcare. Uh, we are a large not-for-profit healthcare delivery system here in Northern Arizona. Uh, we are a tax-exempt organization, so every dollar that we're able to make as an organization, we reinvest uh, for the betterment of the community, services, infrastructure, uh, and the staff and providers that work for us. I believe about 3,000 employees in our healthcare system. We service close to a million people across the region, and that become, will become uh, very uh, relevant when we start to talk about the, the new uh, campus. We are the only level one trauma center uh, in the region, in North Maricopa County. There are 13 level one trauma centers in the state of Arizona. 11 of those reside in Maricopa County or the greater Phoenix area, and what that really means is we bring a tertiary or a level one trauma uh, designation for care. So should you need that emergent life-saving care, uh, you come to Flagstaff uh, Medical Center, and our emergency rooms are open to anyone who needs to seek that medical care, medical care regardless of their ability to pay. With that being said, about 25% of the patients that we care for at Flagstaff Medical Center are considered uh, financially disadvantaged. Uh, last fiscal year, 2021 alone, we provided about $125 million in care for patients that would not have been able to afford those across our 50,000 square miles. We are the sole community provider of healthcare in Northern Arizona, and about, at any given time, about a third of the patients that we service at Flagstaff Medical Center are from our tribal nations, and about 60% of the patients at Flagstaff Medical Center do not reside within the city of, of Flagstaff. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Steve, who's gonna talk a little bit about the current campus uh, and what we're proposing. Thank you. Good afternoon, Vice Mayor and Council. Thanks for having us uh, this afternoon. Um, so just talk a little bit about what, what got us here. Um, everyone in this room is very familiar with the existing Flagstaff Medical Center, um, and it has served this community very well um, in, its, in its time. But where we stand right now is um, at, a, at a teetering point where we are unable to continue to grow, to respond to the needs of the community and the region from a healthcare perspective. So our current facility as it stands right now is more more than 25% smaller than current medical facilities. Um, that is based specifically on a per square foot per bed. Um, we are somewhere around 1,650 square feet per bed and modern hospitals are being built more in the 2,400, 2,500 square feet per bed. And what that means to us is we start to lose capabilities from the support side of things, uh, not only from a growth perspective, but from our ability to continue to react with the needs of technology and the needs of care as they evolve. Um, our inpatient beds span five different buildings. Um, very complicated to navigate our buildings from a wayfinding perspective. I think this aerial depicts well um, how we are bisected by major streets uh, and also surrounded by major streets on all sides, which is um, the majority of the reason why we are incapable of growing where we are. Um, we already have an uh, upwards of a 900 foot push for some of our patients to get from their patient rooms um, to areas of care like imaging, surgery, trauma, and the emergency department. Um, and anywhere we would go in any direction would only make that horizontal push even further. We currently don't have enough parking to meet the demands of the campus as it stands right now, um, and any future growth on campus would only compound that issue. And, and I think this next point is the most important of the points on this slide. Um, in the past year, we have had to defer 5,600 patients from our community, outside of our community, um, and, and those deferrals were not based on acuity, meaning they weren't patients we couldn't take care of because of the level of care we provide. They were patients we couldn't fit in our building, um, and they were sent um, either to Phoenix or Las Vegas, um, and that only compounds um, their health issues as well as their financial issues. Um, and you'll note that 55% of those patients who are being transferred are being transferred off tribal lands. Um, so a little bit about how that manifests itself on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, this is an image of one of our ICU rooms. Um, so the, the red square that is in the middle of the blue drawing, um, that is an outline of the size of our intensive care units. Um, it is specifically the outline of that room that you see our staff trying to take care of a patient in. The blue box that is behind that red square is a 2022 code minimum ICU room in the state of Arizona. So if you were building a new hospital, which we are proposing, Arizona Department of Health Services would make you build that room 
um, at bare minimum to treat an intensive care unit patient. Um, and there are multiple reasons um, why uh, rooms have grown to this size. Um, a lot of it has to do with just how much equipment is in rooms, how much staff it takes to do some of our complicated cases. You can see in the picture what it looks like for our team to try and do a code um, on one of our patients. There's no access at the head or foot of a bed. Um, there is no direct sunlight in this room, which is also code mandated in the construction of hospitals in Arizona. Um, there is no bathroom in this room, and there is also nowhere for the family to be. Um, and as a matter of fact, on our intensive care unit as it stands now, there is nowhere for family to be in the entire department because we had to repurpose one of the waiting rooms into a storage facility because we couldn't meet the needs of storing our technology. Um, so uh, I, I know we're here specifically to talk about regional plan amendment, but um, didn't want to gloss over the fact that this is what um, council will be seeing in, in the coming months. Um, this is our plan um, to fix the ever-changing needs of healthcare for the region. Um, this is uh, approximately 180 acres that NAH owns, um, just west of I-10 off of Beulah. You'll see the large purple structure in the middle, which is um, the anchor tenant of this development and a replacement hospital for Flagstaff Medical Center along with an ambulatory care center um, which will centralize outpatient care and also move um, certain procedures that we currently do in an inpatient setting to an outpatient setting which uh, not only provides a better experience from a patient perspective but also um, provides directly lower cost of care to our patients. What you'll see uh, to the north of it which is right on this image um, is uh, about 315 proposed housing units, um, along with um, some retail up at the north end. Um, and then south of us, you'll see uh, what we're envisioning is health-focused restaurant retail, um, along with some clinical partnerships, other medical office buildings, um, and hopefully being able to bring some um, levels of service and types of service to the community that we currently don't have, like hyperbaric and wound, um, and a... Uh, a robust oncology center that has all of what you need from a medical infusion, um, chemo infusion, and, and rad onc perspective. And then further south in that blue area, you'll see what is a, a well into the future proposed research and development corridor, um, which is part of kind of the economic vitality, which Josh will talk about in a second. Yeah, so one of the things that we are really concerned about um, as we move forward, uh, we're talking a lot about the acute space and how we deliver care, but we do know that social determinants of health are also indicative of the overall health of the community. And so why you're seeing a bigger proposed development is that we know that lifestyle factors along with behavior and economic determinants determine the overall health of a community that we service. And one of the, the great things about the Health and Wellness Village is that we were able to start to bring some of those social determinants together to help further the wellness of the community that we service. And Steve will talk a little bit about how we see that splitting up in the campus. Thank you. So uh, this is a pretty rough layout of our proposed development, um, but wanted to kind of touch on how we touch on all five of these social determinants of health. Um, so up at the top, neighborhood and built environment. Um, we know we have a housing crisis here in Flagstaff, and part of our proposal is to add at minimum 315 multifamily residential units in to help that crisis. Um, healthcare and quality, obviously the anchor tenant of this um, campus with the new hospital and ambulatory care center, social and community context. So um, 30 acres of, of untouched land to the west of us that will act as a buffer between us and the neighbors to the west, um, as well as um, be open uh, park space for the community to be used. So it will be open 24-7 uh, for community use. Um, we are already in coordination um, to make sure it connects into the foots trails and working with parks and recreations to see what kind of active recreation and passive recreation we can have in the area to engage the community. In addition to that, education access and quality. Um, so uh, already talking um, in, with potential partnerships with NAU to build a co-joined simulation center um, so that their students and our nurses can continue their medical education um, and also uh, partnerships with other um, referring healthcare physicians in order for us to continue to grow what we bring to the community. And then finally, that economic stability um, component where we're hoping to broaden research and development for the community and, and bring good paying jobs to the community. Um, so I'll, I know we are on limited time, so I won't um, read uh, every one of these, but these are uh, specifically out of the policies and guidelines that Tiffany had mentioned during her um, presentation. So I won't have to go through every one of these, but we wanted to specifically call out where in our plan we specifically tie to the policies and guidelines that are in the City of Flagstaff's current 
um, plan. So a balance of housing um, with our 315 units, um, well-designed activity centers and corridors with a variety of employment, business, shopping, civic engagement, cultural opportunities, and residential choices. I think we bring every one of those to the table with our proposed development. Um, improving mobility and access throughout the region, as well as establishing a functional, safe, and aesthetic hierarchy of roads and streets. So part of this regional plan amendment is some modification to the proposed street alignments that we've been working on with planning and traffic to make sure they function for not only our proposal, but for the future growth of Flagstaff in that corridor. Uh, make available a variety of housing types at different price points to provide housing opportunity for all economic sectors. So as I said earlier, we will be providing housing as part of our development if approved. Um, we also think our development could be a springboard for future development in that corridor as we continue to bring infrastructure to that area. Um, supporting and encouraging an excellent educational system that promotes critical thinking and job training programs at all levels, right? So that's the educational component, and, and I was trying to tie in with not only CCC and NAU to continue and foster partnerships through the region, um, and then promoting the continued physical and economic viability of the region's commercial districts by focusing investment on existing and new activity centers. Um, so our proposed development um, is obviously um, bringing some of that to a new activity center, um, and, and in our economic development, impact report, which we had done by a third party company and reviewed by the city of Flagstaff. These are some of our estimated economic benefits um, to the city of Flagstaff and the region. So at full build out in 2045, we will generate $387 million of economic impact to the region and community. Um, we will bring uh, through the course of construction in construction jobs and in permanent jobs, over 10,000 jobs um, to the community. Uh, $6.7 million directly to the city of Flagstaff, just in construction tax alone. Um, and then a $1.5 million annual tax paid directly to the city of Flagstaff over the lifetime of the project in perpetuity. Um, and I will close with just, um, Tiffany had mentioned our community engagement plan. We feel we have gone above and beyond from a community engagement perspective um, and have been meeting with the community for nearly two years. Um, so you'll see a very large list of, of folks we have met with throughout those last two years, just within the last couple of weeks. Um, we met with Coconino County leadership. We met with uh, Metro Plan and ADOT in, in speaking of, uh, specifically about the JWP bridge and some of um, what Councilwoman Salas had brought up, along with Mountain Line just last week, um, and Sean Ryan um, from the Mount Dell neighborhood, um, which was spawned specifically from some uh, concerns that he had when we presented to planning and zoning, and we were in a room with him within a week to start to talk to him and address those concerns. So still some work to do with Sean and the Mount Dell community, but I think I think it shows that we're trying to act on these things as quickly as we can. And I think it's important to note where this development support comes from, from a healthcare perspective. Um, Arizona Healthcare Cost Containment System, you may know it as ACCESS, um, is, is fully in support um, and has written in support of our project, as well as the Arizona Medical Association, the Arizona Nurses Association, the Osteopathic Medical Association, the Arizona Public Health Association, and an endorsement from Dr. Richard Carmona, our former US Surgeon General. Um, so with that, I will leave it for questions, and I think we finished in just under 10 minutes, Vice Mayor. Thank you so much. Uh, council, questions for Ms. Antal or the applicant? Council Member McCarthy. Uh, just a quick question. The, the north end has uh, got some residential in it. Would that be like for the whole community or mostly just for... Uh, doctors and nurses that are there either temporarily or on a longer term basis. Yeah, it, it's our proposal that it would be for the entire community. Um, haven't figured out all of the details. I, I would assume out of those 315 units, NAH might reserve a very small portion of them, and, and, and I mean maybe 10 of them um, for our own use, um, for traveling physicians, traveling nurses, which in a rural setting is part of our business. So we may, we may reserve a small part of it, and obviously we, we would want our staff to get use of it, but it's not intended to just be housing for NAH staff. All right, thank you. And thank you, Vice Mayor. Other questions? Hey, I'm not seeing any. So now I will do public comment. Thank you, Mr. McCarthy. I'm on it. I'm going to do in person first, and Heather Domlin, you're up. Uh, 
Good evening, Mayor and members of Council. My name is Heather Domlin. I am currently serving as the CEO and General Manager for Mountain Line Transit. And I'm here as follow-up to our January Board of Directors letter regarding the NAH uh, regional, I'm sorry, rezoning. I'm here to provide a brief update on the status of public transit to the proposed new NAH facility. I want to open by recognizing the work of Northern Arizona Healthcare, uh, the work that they do to serve the many needs of our community. We respect and value the critical care provided to so many, <clears throat> and our goal has always been to ensure that there is ongoing and equitable access to those services. Transit and healthcare are inextricably linked, and since the new NAH location was proposed nearly three years ago, Mountain Line has maintained that the region's largest medical facility should be served by public transit. The proposed new location on South Beulah Boulevard is about one and a half miles from the nearest transit route. After initial conversations with NAH, we evaluated our existing funding resources and determined that there is not capacity within the current transit tax to fund expansion of public transit to the proposed location. Our current system is built around rider and community needs, serving the area's population, economic hubs, and expansion of this service is just not possible without additional funding. I'm happy to share that Mountain Line and Northern Arizona Healthcare have come to an agreement that transit to the new facility is a necessity. And I am appreciative of the many conversations over the last three years about funding, routing, and alternatives. Our professional transit planning team has researched best practices from other communities and has homed in on the most efficient way to serve the new location and connect it to the rest of our transit system. Mountain Line determined that we could cover the required cost, the, I'm sorry, the required capital cost, such as three new buses and the bus stop construction, and we are committed to a portion of the operating cost by reprioritizing funds from streamlining routes to remove duplicate service. We are willing to make this commitment. However, we still need financial partnership to pay for the remaining operational cost. Last week, NAH informed Mountain Line that they do not have the financial capacity to fund the remaining cost to provide public transit service to the proposed location. Because there is also not capacity within the current transit tax to fund this service, NAH has proposed that funding be sought from the City of Flagstaff. Mountain Line is completing a new five-year transit plan that includes many unfunded transit priorities that we have identified through community outreach. All of these will require additional funding. Mountain Line is prepared. Thank you. Thank you. I do see that Council Member Salas has a question. Is that specifically for Ms. Domlin? Uh, thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Actually, for, for both Ms. Uh, Ms. Domlin and the previous uh, speaker, because uh, I had my queue uh, kind of in the queue. Uh, but my question to Ms. Domlin, uh, Ms. Domlin, can you please expound on uh, your last remark about uh, the five-year transit uh, plan that is uh, uh, that is in the process of being developed? Yes, thank and you. And how it impacts to this project, this this uh, regional plan amendment. Sure. It, what I was trying to highlight is that we are in the process of completing our updated five-year transit plan, which does include the expanded service to this proposed location, and that all of that planning effort will result in a question put before City Council and hopefully the voters in 2024 to fund these transit improvements. And I was just trying to confirm that we would be including this route and this service in that funding question in light of the lack of funding from other resources. Thank you. And Council Member Shimoni, you had a question? Thank you, Vice Mayor, and, and thank you, Heather, for being with us and all of your efforts to ensure that there's public transit to our, uh, our regional hospital. A uh, quick, quick follow-up, Heather, if you can speak to the current transit services to the current campus um, from Mountain Line, I'm curious. I've heard that many of their clients travel in from out of town 
and uh, NIH employees and clients don't really utilize transit. I'm curious if you have any data on that. I've also heard that uh, many of NIH's clients utilize Lyft um, rather than taking the bus. If you can speak to that, if you have any insights, I'd appreciate it. Sure, thank you for the question, Council Member Shimoni. I can speak to what Mountain Line has in regards to data on how we serve the current location. We serve it with 15 minute frequency on two routes um, at its current location. The two stops located on a Beaver Street are within the top 10 for our system-wide ridership demands. Uh, about 100 of the Flagstaff Medical Center employees uh, regularly use the EcoPass, and I'll just say that's 100 unique users. That's not one employee going 100 times. And we average that to be about 12,000 trips per year um, on that EcoPass system. And then in addition to that, the medical center does purchase passes under what we call our discounted day pass program. They purchase uh, the maximum allowed of 1,500 day passes. We don't know 100% the use of those passes, but the agreement that we have is that those passes are then used to support our community members. Um, many other nonprofit and social service agencies use these passes for the same reasons. I, I can't speak to the use of, of Lyft or any other TNC or taxi service uh, for the hospital. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Council Member McCarthy. Hi, Heather. Hi, um, any future bus service out to this potential new hospital site, would this kind of tie into the airport? getting some service to there. We don't have service to the airport right now, I don't believe, is that correct? Thank you, Council Member McCarthy. We do not have service uh, currently to the airport. We had a micro uh, transit pilot that ended a couple months ago. Uh, the way we have designed it within our five-year plan, the airport will be served by a different route than the route that we are proposing to NAH. Uh, and that is due in large part to the type of riders and the demand for uh, pickup and drop off at those two locations will be drastically different. For example, a plane comes in how many times per day and doctor's appointments are how far apart. Thank you for You're that. Welcome. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other questions. Thank you. Thank you. Our next participant is Whitney Cunningham. Thank you, Vice Mayor, Council. My name is Whitney Cunningham with Aspie Watkins and Diesel 123 North San Francisco Street. My firm is working with the hospital in connection with this project, but I'm not here in that capacity. Uh, instead, I'm here on behalf of Charlie and Glenda Odegaard, 1840 West Getaway Trail in Flagstaff, who provided a, a brief statement that they asked for me to share. This was originally written to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Dear Commissioners, we, together with our parents, Van and Carol Odegaard, may be the closest residential neighbors to Northern Arizona Healthcare's proposed new hospital and health village. Our properties border the hospital's property, and we are all agree, and we all agree to move from our old homes to make room for this project. This meant our parents moving from the home they built in the 1980s and where they raised their family, including Charlie. Needless to say, it was a difficult and emotional decision for all of us. It was also an important decision. For decades, Carol Odegaard worked as a nurse at Flagstaff Medical Center. During her years there, we all came to respect the mission of the hospital and the need for quality medical care in our town. We want, and our town deserves, the highest quality of medical care, which the old hospital facility is no longer able to provide. We understand it needs to move, and while it meant that we also had to move, we welcome the new hospital to this area. Where we live has for many years been planned as a growth area for Flagstaff. During Charlie's years serving on city council, we were very aware of these plans. And while the new hospital will be a regional use instead of a neighborhood use, this change is consistent with what is already here, a regional county park and a regional airport and business park just across the freeway. There may, be no more, there may be no perfect location for a new hospital in Flagstaff, but this one is pretty good. Now it is your turn as commissioners to make an important decision for Flagstaff, as we had to do for our families. 
we hope and trust that you will approve the minor regional plan amendment and allow NAH's project to continue moving forward. Sincerely, Charlie Odegaard and Glinda Odegaard. Thank you. Thank you. David Hayward. Uh, council, uh, not mayor, it looks like. Um, thank you for having me this evening. I'll take a second because I just rushed in uh, literally a few seconds ago. Um, uh, I um, am obviously in favor of the regional plan amendment uh, for moving the hospital. Um, <clears throat> I, I'll, I'll take the timer personally. Um, but we, um, we need to look forward um, to the issues uh, that we will uh, be seeing uh, when the, the project comes up for rezone. Um, and we need, quite frankly, uh, your guys' leadership um, when it comes to resolving those issues. Um, I think we also need uh, leadership from uh, senior staff. If, if Greg was here, I'd, I'd tell him um, that we need his leadership. Uh, we have two you know, significant problems um, that we have temporary solutions for. Um, you know, and I say this as a, as a private citizen, I'm not involved in this project at all. But uh, the, the fire um, and police service uh, study that is, has come forward, um, quite frankly, is not worth the paper it's written on. Um, there's, a, there's a very good reason for that. Um, uh, NEH, I think, probably deserves a little bit of blame in, in the uh, selection of their consultant for that project. Um, but quite frankly, when you ask seven retired firefighters to give you the firefighters union's uh, opinion on what fire service is gonna be, uh, you're gonna get a pretty obvious answer. Um, it might sound rude, but I don't ask my five-year-old to set uh, the dessert menu for the week, um, and uh, we shouldn't be making the same decisions about our city. We need to design our fire department to serve our community, uh, not uh, design our community to serve our fire department. Um, I would say that the second issue um, that I've, I've heard a lot about, and you know, I'm, I'm gonna be up here and, and say some frank things um, that NAH is probably not willing to say in front of you, um, is our traffic impact analysis. Um, we've spent two years on a process that normally takes six months. Uh, you know, this is an extremely important project, um, but I've said to some of you in the past the, the notion that um, our not-for-profit hospital should be on the hook for improving the interchange at, at Continental and, and Country Club um, just doesn't pass the sniff test. Um, I'm not in a position to second-guess that math. Um, I don't think most people in this room are in a position to sec second-guess that math. Um, but good governments um, and good management um, says, hey, this doesn't seem right to me. Let's go back, look at this, um, and, and take another shot. And my time is up. So thank you very much. Thank you. And now I will take the online public comments. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I have two for online public comment tonight. Our first one is... Alexander Sheikin, you may go ahead and address Mayor and Council. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Alex Schenken. I am a resident at 54 West Nice Trail and Ponderosa Trails. Um, in general, I approve of this project moving forward. However, um, while <clears throat> NAH has said that they've held many uh, community meetings, which is fantastic. I've seen very few of the um, uh, outcomes of those meetings reflected in their plans. I've seen, in fact, nothing out of that. There are uh, some consistent uh, concerns that the residents around the proposed development express, including noise, which is already present from um, I-40 and I-17, uh, which will increase with ambulances and helicopters, um, potential increased vagrancy, which the communities around the current uh, NAH uh, are um, uh, subject to, um, unfortunately. 
as well as traffic safety concerns um, that none of which I've seen addressed. I, what I've heard is that these will all get pushed back to the entitlement round, but um, my, I am concerned that, that these uh, uh, community-based concerns won't get addressed there either because they haven't been addressed to date. Um, finally, the, um, uh, someone there mentioned environmental vitality um, and all of these uh, concerns that the community has brought up involve environmental vitality. Many studies have shown that increased noise can affect uh, wildlife in adverse ways that we're uh, barely aware of, but it affects wildlife and it also affects the residents. Um, so overall, uh, I think it would be wonderful for this uh, development to be uh, uh, moved forward, but uh, all I've heard is talk of development and not of concern for doing the development properly. Um, and so I hope, I, I think the communities around the development are gonna be the ones to best express and maintain uh, the quality of the environment. Um, the council is there to uh, hear from the community and make sure that we're heard by the developers. So I, I hope that you can step into this role because I don't see any place where we're gonna be guaranteed to be heard in this process. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Our next participant. Our next commenter for tonight is Michelle James. Michelle, you may go ahead and unmute yourself and address Mayor Council, Vice Mayor and Council. Thank you. Thanks. Hello, Mayor, Vice Mayor and Council. My name is Michelle James. I'm Executive Director of Friends of Flagstaff's Future. FCube continues to be concerned about the lack of written commitments by NAH to specific and important necessary investments related to building the proposed new hospital. These commitments include roadway design, intersection design, public transit, fire service, and what will happen at the existing campus. Recent staff recommendations include the need for a travel demand management plan, addressing the climate and housing emergencies, adhering to the climate neutrality plan, providing recreation facilities, and compliance with dark sky regulations. Flagstaff Regional, the Flagstaff Regional Plan states the regional suburban activity centers are larger mixed-use centers that include, quote, transit with an emphasis on both residents and visitors. Visitors. This means that uh, activity center S16 will need to provide transit for people who want to visit or live outside of this activity center. While well, FCube understands that the two additional applications submitted by NH for rezoning and their specific plan will be reviewed by Planning and Zoning and Council at a future date, we want to point out that at this time, NAH has not yet entered into an agreement with Mountain Line committing to pay an appropriate share of the cost related to providing public transit to the new hospital. FCube encourages Council and the City to continue to work with NAH to, to obtain written commitments for public transit, as well as other outstanding mitigation issues that NAH has yet to address in their applications related to constructing a new hospital. FCube again urges Council and NAH to take the time that's necessary to obtain firm commitments now about how this project will develop in the years to come. This is, a, this is an extremely important project. Our community needs to know that NAH has committed in writing to fulfilling mitigation measures identified as necessary by staff and the community. NAH is proposing a huge development within city limits. The long-term impacts on Flagstaff are too important not to be addressed adequately. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, council, time to turn it inward. Please use the chat box with your Q&A. Any questions, comments? Council Member Salas. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice Mayor, because I just, I had this question right after the, 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 the applicant um, made a presentation and my, my, my cue was not recognized. Um, I have a question to uh, the applicant in terms of their presentation on the um, benefits to the community with regards to transportation and transit. Um, sir, I think it was Mr. Ice who was speaking. Um, 
my question has something to do about um, the meeting held with uh, ADOT and Metroplan. And then I have a, a follow-up question with regard to transportation and transit. But that's my first question. Thank you. Are, are you are you looking for a recap, Councilwoman Salas, of our meeting with Metroplan and ADOT? I do, because uh, it was briefly mentioned at Metroplan board meeting uh, last Tuesday, last Thursday, because we had a full agenda. And I did mention uh, this in person um, to Director Halikowski at the Rural Transportation Summit in September, um, kind of um, uh, in planting the seed uh, for ADOT to be to be involved in um, the process of uh, um, this regional plan amendment with regard to the JW Powell Bridge. Uh, it's actually a replacement. So, so the bridge is already being replaced, but it needs more funding in terms of making it a complete street with, uh, with uh, pedestrian and bicyclist safety uh, in mind. So if you could, if you could summarize uh, the, the, the gist of the meetings you had with ADOT and Metroplan, it will be um, informational and helpful. Thank you. Great, yeah, thank you, Councilwoman Salas, and I can, and just to give a little bit of context um, for Vice Mayor and Council and, and members in the room who aren't familiar with the backstory, um, it, it was brought to our attention that ADOT was uh, planning on a replacement of the JW Powell Bridge um, in kind, meaning as a two-lane bridge, um, which um, as, as we were looking at it as NAH um, and in partnership with our traffic engineers and some members of the city um, thought was not in the greatest benefit of the community moving forward, um, quite frankly, uh, regardless of whether our project moves forward um, with the planned growth in Southern Flagstaff and access to the park and hospital, or sorry, park and, and airport. Um, so we reached out to the executive director of, of Metro Plan um, and, and asked for his assistance in talking with ADOT about it. Um, executive director uh, Miles Mileback was um, very uh, partnering through this process um, and did um, get us a meeting with ADOT. I think uh, just kind of anecdotally speaking, what was interesting about the entire process to me was just days prior to meeting with ADOT to talk to them about um, and show them what the future growth plans were for Flagstaff and how ADOT might want to investigate whether or not this is a four-lane replacement or a two-lane replacement. NAH was informed from um, traffic that the replacement of that bridge was actually not part of our traffic mitigation um, and phase one of our project was not what was causing it. Um, with that said, um, we still met with um, Metro Plan and ADOT along with um, some city staff to ensure that we were doing the right thing from a partnership perspective and could, can you to try and move this forward. So right now, um, ADOT is um, in process of, of re-examining it and seeing um, if that can be uh, funded at a four-lane bridge instead of a two-lane bridge, um, along with um, the work that Councilwoman Salas had mentioned that um, Metro Plan is undertaking through their board. Thank you. Council Member Salas, do you have another question? Yes, yes. Uh, thank, thank you, Madam Vice Mayor, and I appreciate the answer from from um, NAH. Also, uh, also for, for for the benefit of of everyone listening, um, one of the priorities uh, approved by the Metro Plan Board last week uh, for the project priority list for the fifteen point six million um, for as part of the 300 million Greater Arizona Transportation Project has something to do with, with um, uh, the JW Powell Bridge uh, replacement over I-17. So um, the Metro Plan has made that commitment as part of a priority uh, of uh, the different projects being pursued to be funded um, uh, with the 15.6 mil million uh, proposal. Um, so thank you for that. So my follow-up question that has uh, something to do with, you know, um, the regional plan um, amendment is the future of transportation and transit in the area. 
and I we've heard Miss Miss Dumbledore from NAPTA, and uh, I'd like to hear from uh, from NAH what their plans uh, are in terms of uh, transportation service for uh, for patients and um, and employees. Uh, yeah. So ultimately speaking. Um, NAH would love to partner with Mountain Line in getting public transportation to our new development. Um, the discussion that was had um, with Mountain Line um, last week was really about the appropriate funding part of it, and I think we heard from a speaker just before about NAH committing to um, appropriate funding, um, and currently the request at the table is uh, NAH is the only funder of that line. Um, we feel it does serve other parts of the community and the greater good of the community, and we feel we're bringing direct impact to the community, not only through the plus $100 million that we um, have in charity care per year, but also all of the economic development stimulus and um, taxes that we're gonna um, have brought into the city. So um, at, at the end of the day, that's where we would like to be, is in an agreement um, with Mountain Lion and other partners that are gonna directly benefit from transportation in, in that part of town to make that line operational. Um, in the meantime, what uh, NIH has said is that we are dedicated to um, patient transportation for those who need it. Um, we are, whether or not you know it, we are already in the transportation business. Um, someone brought up lift rides earlier. Um, we, we did give out over 700 lift rides this year to patients who needed access to places, um, more, more than not um, specifically to the shelter because we don't currently have public transportation that serves the shelter in this community. Um, so we are already in that business. We also have our own guardian medical air and transport as well as um, paratransit that we coordinate for our patients um, along with care coordination specifically for access patients who have um, transportation to and from their doctor's visits as part of their, their benefit through access. So um, on top of that, um, we are committed to point-to-point to point transportation for the patients that would need it above and beyond the patient population that I just spoke about, um, which we do not feel is, is a major um, amount of, of patients within the city of Flagstaff proper um, that have access directly to a transportation line now. I have a follow-up question, Madam Vice Mayor. Um, thank you. So uh, thank you for that answer. So is, um, um, any age um, um, considering to build the bus stops at the new hospital? Uh, you know, I understand it's still a regional plan amendment. If we're not into the to the weeds of going over the the merits of of a rezone and other other um, other um, uh, process uh, for this project to to uh, to take place. But at, at this moment, I'm just, I just, I'm just curious of uh, the commitment that NAH can, can share with us now in terms of uh, building bus stops at uh, the new hospital. Sure, sure, Councilman Zahn. Location. Zahner. Yeah, thank you for the question. And yes, we are uh, committed to that. Um, we are also committed to continuing to work with Mountain Line on the layout of our roads, um, entryways, and drop-offs to ensure uh, proper public transportation in the future. Thank you. Council Member um, Shimoni. Last, last, last question, Madam Vice Mayor. Okay. Uh, um, just expounding on, I, I, I asked uh, Mr. Ice to expound on the, um, the economic, um, I think he used the word economic stability for me. It's still economic vitality and economic development. So you have some, uh, uh, um, you know, like 387 million uh, in terms of Benefits and ten thousand jobs and six, you know, six point seven million um, related uh, sales tax uh, um, in terms of construction, but in terms of local jobs, um, do you have like um, a, a guesstimate of of local jobs that will be available to um, Northern Arizona region? 
Uh, I, I do have that um, as part of our economic impact report. I don't have that number off the top of my head, but I can follow up with that um, to, to vice mayor and council after this meeting. Okay, so, and my last question is, what uh, are your next steps in terms of continued community engagement? In, in regard to the existing campus or the new campus? For both. So for, from a new campus perspective, um, we have uh, at current met the obligations um, as necessary for our zoning cases. Um, with that said, we continue to meet with people on a, on a very regular basis. Um, when you heard me speak earlier, um, I, I made mention of the meeting that we had with Sean Ryan, who represents the Homeowners Association for Mount Dell, right? That was a, that was a one person meeting with Sean um, that we spent two hours with him the other day after hearing some of his concerns about about how the development could affect the Mount Dell neighborhood. So um, we have continued to be open about meeting with anyone who has any concerns and either trying to address them or explain to them how we can't address them um, and understanding what those implications may be. Um, as far as the existing uh, campus is going, um, we, we, we have retained the services of uh, Puma, which is an urban management company um, that some of you may be familiar with because the city of Flagstaff has worked with them along with the Downtown Business Alliance on what the revisioning of Downtown Flagstaff could be in the future. And we have, returned, we have retained their services to do a similar study as to what a community-based redevelopment of our existing campus could be. Um, we have started a community, community advocacy group um, that we have had one round of meetings with that is a combination of some members of council, um, some members of Friends of Flagstaff's Future, some members of the Downtown Business Alliance and other community leaders. Um, and we are committed to a uh, redevelopment of the existing campus that is community forward, uh, but also has an economic stability um, that can last the test of time for Flagstaff. And that is something that we do plan on putting in writing in our development agreement. I know there were some questions brought up earlier about why we haven't put anything in writing and um, the application process is not the right time to put those things in writing. It is through the development of a development agreement, which um, our team and the city team are currently in the middle of. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Salas, for your, your questions. Council Member Shimoni. Thank you, Vice Mayor, and, and good afternoon, uh, Stephen and, and, and Josh and NAH's team. Um, appreciate you all being here and your presentation. Uh, I also appreciate Councilmember Salas' questions, so thank you, Councilmember, for those questions. Uh, a lot to think about here, for sure, and, you know, I could talk about housing, and, and you know, I'd love to see a little bit more housing here, as you know, or I could talk about fire and um, first responders. But what I really want to focus on uh, is, is transit as well. Um, you know, obviously, Stephen, you and I have talked plenty about transit and all these topics. But uh, knowing that there's over 100 employees that utilize the Eco Pass and that NAU purchased 1,800 day passes last year, um, and that you have friends and family wanting to visit patients. Do you really do you feel good about Lyft being able to meet those needs, um, and and are you planning to give employees uh, Lyft rides each day who utilize the bus line currently? No, um, and, and I don't think uh, Lyft is the only answer. Um, as I said earlier, w what we'd ultimately like to do is come to agreement with Mountain Line on an operational bus system um, where the current disagreement is is the appropriate source of funding. As, as I said earlier, right now the request is that NAH is the only funder of a public bus line that will serve multiple locations and is a direct community benefit. Um, so. Um, what, what we have talked about in addition to the lift rides, which even if we have public transportation, um, those 700 lift rides with the majority of them being from patients discharging from our emergency department and going to the shelter will still be a benefit that NIH will provide because bus service won't go to the shelter. Um, so on top of that, we can run point to point shuttle from um, Mountain Lines line over to our facility. Um, and if we're talking just employee based, there was um, some discussion earlier about how the airport functions. 
Um, well, our employees function in a very similar fashion. We are a very shift-based organization, um, typically a six to six or seven to seven, um, and that is when the majority of our um, staff would be on the bus. So what we're committing to is that we will provide that service and we think we can provide adequate service at a much lower cost and be able to reuse the difference in funds to continue to grow healthcare for the community. Stephen, just to clarify, the, the shuttle you're talking about is basically between the Walmart parking lot and the southern part of town and the new campus. And that would basically, you know, someone might have to take two or three buses to actually access the new campus. Um, is that correct? This is Josh. I stepped in. I, I think we have to look at those 100 employees, right? We know that 70% of our staff are closer to the new campus. So for us to assume that our ridership is going to maintain the same on Mountain Line would probably be uh, short-sighted in our time. So what we need to do is we'll go back and we'll talk with our staff on those 100 uh, people that have those passes. Some of those may very well live in Ponderosa Trails and actually use bikes and walking as we're promoting in the city, uh, which will actually be closer. But I think what Steve is suggesting is that we are committed to make sure that our employees and our, the people that we service can get to and from campus, and we're open at looking how to do that. And... Uh, something that is more more sustainable. Probably no new, no secret to anyone here. Um, right now, healthcare is ex experiencing um, significant challenges as it relates to uh, the economic viability. Healthcare insurance companies in the past year have seen 70% improvement in uh, overall net income. Uh, organizations, not for profit healthcare organizations across the country, are seeing about a 70% of them going to are going to produce a negative operating margin this year. Um, so we're just making sure that whatever we do and we commit to from a community perspective, that we can continue to, continue to deliver the high level and high quality care that we've been able to do for many, many years. And, and that's what our commitment is. Okay, thank you for that, Josh. And would you agree that um, that, that plan needs to be in place as part of the DA, DA before council approves that? Um, I, I think our, our stance is that we should put that in the development agreement along with um, all of the other uh, things that we need to agree on. Okay, and, and, and wrapping up here, Vice Mayor, um, uh, and Mountain Mine is, just to, just to clarify, Mountain Mine is propose, proposing a proportional share, proportional share to the cost, 50-50 uh, for capital, 50%, 50% split, and then two-thirds Mountain Mine, or NAH for the operational, and one-third Mountain Mine. So it isn't fully on NAH, but I can see how, you know, you might call that fully on NAH, although Mountain Mine is a strong partner in that. Uh, my, my last question, Vice Mayor and Council and uh, Josh and Stephen is, you know, how much is NAH planning to invest in transit? Is there any uh, numbers that have been thrown around in terms of how much is fair? Uh, I don't think we've thrown out any numbers, but I think the number that we're on and Steve's involved in more of those is about $860,000 a year in perpetuity. That represents what percentage of our overall it's operating margin? Thirteen percent of our overall profit margin would be just for transit. Uh, that's kind of the, the first step of that. If you if you put that out with even the numbers that you that we're talking about here, with the amount of employees, a hundred, and the patients, um, we could probably pay for about forty-two thousand lift rides. So what we're suggesting is that we want to work together with the city and transit to make sure that we have an effective system to get people to and from. Uh, medical care. As we mentioned, 60% of the patients that we service come from outside of Flagstaff. So a lot of those are coming via air, as you, as you saw from noise, or via ambulance, or own personal uh, vehicle. So we're committed, again, to working with the city and, and Mountain Line on what that access looks like. We're just suggesting that we think there may be a better way to do it. And thank you. And, and I'll just say in closing, you know, just to clarify again, um, you know, that that, that 860000 Josh, that you mentioned, I, I agree with you. That's what we're talking about. Um, but, um, you know, that, that there's, there's clear communication that also if, if something gets passed by the voters or if there's other funding that's made available or found, uh, you all would be off the hook. It's just a matter of, you know, making sure that there's something in place until we yeah. find additional funding, right? So I just want to make sure we're on the same page. And I, and I appreciate that. And I, um, we, we like that. What we're trying to make sure is that we're sustainable long term, right? And so, as I mentioned when I was speaking, we're a tax-exempt, not-for-profit health care organization. Every single dollar that we make, we reinvest in infrastructure, services that don't generate revenue, and then all the access uh, to care. And as that changes, each year we invest probably about 25 or $30 million back into infrastructure. And the way that we're able to do that is on the, the profits that we do make as a tax-exempt organization. We're just making sure that what we commit to, we can continue to invest in the services that you've all come to expect, myself too. That's why I moved here is because we have amazing health care, and I want to make sure that we maintain that.
Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Shimoni. Others? I'll bite. Let's see where to start here. Um, <laughs> there's just so much to talk about, and obviously there's been a long, ongoing conversation about all of this. Uh, I, I think I'll start by thanking city staff in particular for all the hard work that you all have dedicated into this process um, and taking this ball and running with it uh, and doing so under um, stressful conditions and tight timelines. Uh, I just really want to give a shout out to our people and our organization uh, that have worked so hard on this. And, you know, I can extend that to, to Josh and Stephen and your team as well. Uh, I can't even imagine the number of hours that go into all of this. You know that you have been uh, engaged in a very robust community outreach effort. Um, you've invested time, money, energy, and relationships uh, into doing that. I just, I, I also want to acknowledge that I, I see the need um, for an expanded regional hospital. I, I think you guys have made the case. Uh, the footprint you're on right now isn't going to cut it, and it's going to become uh, increasingly inadequate uh, into the future, uh, both technology-wise and just capacity-wise. Um, I really like your plan for using a, a vertical strategy um, for patient care. And I've joked with you before that I'm training for a half marathon right now, so I haven't needed your hospital services. <laughs> you can use the stairs. <laughs> um, but the, the point is that w none of us ever know when we'll uh, need a hospital visit. Uh, maybe we're just visiting someone. Um, maybe we're the patient ourselves. Uh, those moments, if they haven't happened, they're certainly going to be in our future at some point. Um, and I want to I want to be able to feel proud taking advantage of those services and that quality of care uh, and having been a part of the process. Um, you know, I'm not as convinced about the, the retail, the lodging, the research and development and the for profit aspects of the broader project. Uh, and I, I think we forget about that element of the conversation a lot when we're talking about, uh, you know, paying our fair way and what our fair share of the burden is. Uh, I think there's still plenty of time to work a lot of that stuff out. Um, obviously, we're, we're gonna be at the table still here for a long while. You know, uh, David Hayward mentioned that we need to show leadership in resolving several open questions, and I absolutely agree. Um, I th think we're, we take a slightly different perspective on a couple of those things, but that's, that's where we're at as a community uh, is, is playing with the tension inherent in uh, a lot of these things. David, I, I, I might take issue with your analogy that uh, firefighters and public safety personnel asking for adequate resources is similar to uh, kids uh, designing the dessert menu, but we can talk about that um, some other time uh, and get into the, the, the details of that. <clears throat> you know, I, and also, uh, Josh and Steven, you, you've, you know, I, I really see a lot of effort in terms of how do we address this public safety resources concern um, that this new fr footprint will generate. Um, I'm really pleased with the way you're taking our, my dark sky questions seriously, and I'd like to see more movement on that as well. Um, and we just talked about the John Wesley Powell Bridge replacement, and uh, I, I want to give you full credit for the efforts you're making on behalf of these other connected uh, development processes, right? Um, but, but I am still concerned about some of these things. And um, you know, the, one of the speakers, Alex, online, he told us that he doesn't see any place in this process where he feels locals are guaranteed to be heard. And I think that hits something very important for me um, you know, I'm, I'm committed to being at the table as all this gets worked out now and down the road. Um, but I also feel the need to be in the role of continuing to push hard on behalf of folks like Alex. 
Uh, this is a massive development no matter what. And I feel it deserves skepticism as a default. Uh, I don't want to be thought of as adversarial uh, to you folks here. I actually really appreciate the partnerships that are coming out of this. And I embrace the vision of the complex uh, that's going to come out of this over the next five to ten years and beyond. Um, and I hope Josh, you and Stephen and, and others involved can really appreciate that. Um, you know, it doesn't feel like a very comfortable place to be, uh, but I knew what I was getting into by signing up for this role, and you guys know how big a deal this massive development is. So I feel the conversation just really needs to continue playing out, and I look forward to that fruitful back and forth to, uh, today and beyond, always with the deepest regards and admiration and respect. Um, you know, one issue, the, the lift thing versus public transportation, I, I just wanted to make a comment about that too. Um, I, I think that this door-to-door -door service is great. And, uh, you know, one of you just mentioned uh, how many lift rides uh, could be purchased for all this other public uh, transportation money we're talking about. And maybe I misunderstood your point. I don't know, but I, I do feel it's a bit tone deaf to the larger goal of lifting up a thriving public transit system that is sustainable and sufficiently far-reaching so that people's transit behavior starts to adapt. Uh, the city of Flagstaff is involved in a big shift right now, and we're trying to reduce vehicle miles traveled. And the, the, the service you're recommending uh, is, is not the answer to that problem. And I know you guys recognize that. I'm not trying to uh, lecture you. Um, but the point is your role in realizing that goal is small, and it shouldn't be abused. Uh, but my role in that goal is a big one, and it involves cobbling together every victory that we can get. So I hope you appreciate that tension. Um, Stephen, it sounds like you want to respond. Do you, I, I just wanted to clarify a few things if, yeah. if you're okay with it. So thank you for, for your thoughts, Councilman Eslin. And then I'll wrap up. I, I think you know the, the, the lift ride comment specifically or the start of that discussion was in regard to um, a, a community benefit we provide to patients that are going to somewhere that they cannot get to by the bus. Um, and so that is a true number that is even downtown with um, access to public transportation. So that number was at 700 rides. I think Josh was using the 42,000 rides just as a context number to understand where we fall from a dollar's perspective. Um, and so I don't think we're out of alignment in the theory of public transportation and how critical it is and where we should be striving to get. I think we're out of alignment in the fact that um, it should be the burden of a nonprofit healthcare system to provide that, um, where we feel where we provide direct community benefit from a healthcare perspective and from an economic development perspective, we provide a great deal of resources to the city of Flagstaff that could be utilized to fund that line. Absolutely fair. And I appreciate you having the chance to, to make that, you know, maybe rebuttal is too strong a word, but clarification uh, for all of our purposes. You know, so I, I do feel in a slightly uncomfortable posi position here. Um, I, my, my sense is that this process has cinched the votes to proceed, and I very much wish it well, and I will absolutely remain engaged throughout of it. I, I, I very much want to have a seat at the table. Um, but at the same time, I do deeply believe that our community deserves a historic record on this that reflects the dissatisfied and dispirited voices out there. I don't think it's appropriate for this project to launch with unanimous support from Flagstaff City Council. Uh, I just need to make sure that those who see this big development as troubling feel heard and respected. And so I'm casting a dissenting vote so that the tension inherent in this monumental development is accurately represented. Um, Ultimately, just because this will be an entitlement case doesn't mean NAH is entitled to a glide path forward. And I hope you understand uh, that awkward position to be in um, and the, the desire to reflect that uh, in the record. Um, and respectfully, looking forward to uh, how this process plays out over time. Thank you. Thank you. Others? Council Member House. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Um, thank you for the presentation and thank you to the public commenters who, who spoke on this. Um, 
you know, through the conversation, I've, I've very much been struggling with coming up with the, the best comment uh, on this um, because I, I feel very much the tension um, that exists within the community, um, not in opposition to the recognized need. Um, however, I, I believe where the tension exists is in those numerous unknowns um, and the idea of a, a project of this magnitude moving forward um, without having those conversations or perhaps without having satisfaction within them. Um, I, part of where I, I very much struggle in this, it, it comes down to those various needs and concerns that have been raised up uh, throughout the conversation this evening, um, not the least of which is transit, but also the environmental and, and other impacts um, that this project may entail. Um, and to be clear, um, from the conversations that we've had in the past, um, I, I, I very much appreciate uh, the, the level of transparency that you've brought to those levels of unknowns. Um, I just feel like there needs to be that, that voice and recognition of um, that community concern, that, that those concerns are valid. Um, it is a very weighty tension um, that we bring to this discussion and um, it, it, it's not an easy process to move forward with those still still out there. Um, so really, I, I, I just want to emphasize that, um, you know, I, I heard the comment earlier from uh, community members both tonight, uh, particularly from Alex, um, but also from others who have messaged us and emailed us and, and engaged in this conversation in other ways. Um, that it's the, the level of not seeing the outcomes, not knowing exactly where the path forward is um, that leads to hesitation. Um, what we've heard over and over is that there is general approval, there is general sense of this project being needed um, for a number of reasons, but those concerns also have a lot of validity. Um, so I just ask that as we continue in this conversation, we keep those things in mind, we keep hearing those different voices in the community, and um, we don't look at any one part of this process as um, either landing on one side or the other. Um, it needs to be ongoing conversations, and, and I hope that we continue in those with the level of transparency that we're uh, attempting right now. Thanks. Thank you. And I will offer a couple of words. Um, I do want to thank staff and to NAH for all of your work. And I do share a lot of the concerns expressed tonight. And I look forward to seeing those concerns addressed from Mountain Line to the county and their concerns with Fort Tuthill. Uh, we didn't hear a lot about that tonight, but they have emailed. And I believe we have good dialogue and I, I need to see that continue and appreciate your effort in that. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Other council members? Vice Mayor. Council Member Shimoni. Thank you. Um, Stephen and Josh, I just wanted to give you the opportunity to speak to um, transit one more time. I know we, we're, we're all bringing that up and we're talking a lot about it, but I'm just curious, uh, does NAHC their responsibility in transit. I know you've talked about proportional and, and that you want to be proportional, but um, I've heard that, you know, NAH doesn't feel that they have responsibility and that it is of the city and the community more than on them. Um, I just wanted to give you a chance to clear that up. Yeah, I, I, think, we, I think we do have um, some responsibility. Um, I think we have to get to a place where the, the numbers from a proportionality make sense. Um, and I also think we, we need to look at um, how this topic is discussed um, for future developments um, because I'm, I'm not currently familiar outside of Snowball of any um, private company that is participating in the public transportation system. Um, and I do think it's a, it's a larger conversation that I'd love to continue talking about with you all on how to make that an equitable discussion um, and not just something tied to this one particular project for this city. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, I'll just say I, I struggle with that, you know, like I, I know that time's running out 
and we need to figure this out sooner than later. Um, I, I appreciate Councilmember Aslan's uh, recognizing of the tension and and the the concern in the community, but um, I I want to see this move forward. I do. You know that I support what you all have been working towards, uh, and I really appreciate the efforts that you've you've put in. Um, we're close, but you know I I, I don't see a clear plan. Um, you know I. I feel comfortable putting it on the ballot and having the community vote on that tax increase in a couple of years from now, um, council. But that's the big question: Will they? Will the community vote on that? And and I do think that public transit needs to be available to folks at this new location when the doors are open. So um, I really appreciate members of council all speaking up about transit being a concern. And um, Stephen, I look forward to working on that with you and, and other and others working on that, um, please do keep Mountain Line included in the discussions. And um, we, we need to figure this out, um, you know, and again, knowing that it is very likely temporary, you know, just until we find those other partners and other funding. But uh, I think we need it in place before we can't just rely on Lyft or a, sh or a shuttle to the Walmart. I don't think that's adequate. I really don't. Um, that being said, I, I don't plan to be voting no tonight. I plan to be voting yes, but uh, I, I am very hesitant about it, just knowing that we don't have a clear plan, and I look forward to that being figured out prior to the DA. Thank you. Yeah, understood. Thank you, Councilman, and look forward to more discussion on it. Thank you. I am not seeing any other questions or comments, so I will now close the public hearing. Council, is there a motion? Council Member Salas. Um, uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I was waiting for Mr. McCarthy to say something uh, about this project, but I do recall uh, the robust discussion that that um, emanated from our September 29th budget retreat. And in my notes, uh, council member um, McCarthy mentioned something about um, uh, proportional responsibility when it comes to um, asking, uh, asking development to pay for itself and other, and other infrastructure uh, that uh, may be needed or required as you build out the project. So uh, I do remember uh, that, Mr. Uh, uh, McCarthy, proportional responsibility. With that in mind, and I did mention that uh, this, this, um, this is about uh, a minor regional plan amendment. And there have, there are already, there are already wills in motion in terms of of um, of Metro Plan, which consists of the city, the county, ADOT, Mountain Line, uh, and NAU in terms of uh, allocating five million out of the fifteen point six million funding, if approved um, as part of the the Greater Arizona uh, initiative uh, to the tune of three hundred million. Um, also, back in uh, September at the at September 29th budget retreat, I um, I used the word synergy multiple times because this is a regional plan amendment. You know, I have always believed in in the value of synergy, where where the whole is much greater than the sum of its parts. And I believe at this point, NAH has uh, done its part in, in terms of pursuing and creating that synergy. Um, I know this is the first step of, uh, of uh, a series of, of uh, entitlement applications to move forward with relocating and building a new hospital. You know, this is the minor regional plan amendment and then there will be a specific plan, concept zoning map uh, with rezone and a development agreement. Um, I mean, uh, uh, I will not be part of council when those discussions take place. So I will take this opportunity to um, 
to provide my two cents of advice to current and future counsel when we're faced with this, you know, this um, this um, challenging uh, situations, um, and when we're sometimes we're put a, a situation where we're like, damn if you do, damn if you don't. What, however, we vote, we'll, we'll, we will get criticisms and attack. Um, I just, I just hope and pray that council will build the um, ability of discernment and mindfulness individually and collectively. Recognize the data, the facts and figures, and recognize the opinions and which are uh, which are very diverse, you know, like belly buttons. Um, and also recognize at the end of the day, um, who do we serve? Do we serve the specific group of constituents who voted council? Do we, do we, do we decide as, um, as a matter of uh, ideological uh, dogmatism? Is it, is it a matter of partisan politics? But at the end of the day, council decision impacts all of the citizens of Flagstaff, 78,000, I think we're at 79,000 now. So just keep that in mind. Um, with that case, Madam Vice Mayor, if it's appropriate, I'm ready to make a motion. Please do. Okay, let me pull out the agenda item. Let's see. I prop I'm, it is my honor to, to move, read, to read resolution number 20, 2022 by 556 by title only, by title only, because the Planning and Zoning Commission has unanimous, unanimously recommended approval and considering request for an amendment of the plan because the goals and policies uh, presented are in conformance with the overall vision of the Flagstaff Regional Plan that establishes the vision for the future growth and development of Flagstaff and its surrounding areas through goals and policies. General plans are not static documents. They recognize growth as a dynamic process, which may re require visions to the plan as, as circumstances or changes warrant. Thank you. I'll second that. Any further discussion? Council Member McCarthy. Well, thank you, Vice Mayor. I think I've been challenged to make a comment. You know, anybody who's been watching me for the last six years knows that I'm not shy about making comments if I have something to say. And I didn't really have anything dramatic to say here. Um, I will say I've been involved in some of the discussions about uh, Arizona Department of Transportation, uh, support for the bridge, uh, which I, I think is good. Um, I am supportive of trying to get some, make sure we have transportation out to the uh, uh, new hospital. But I'll also say that it, it is interesting that we don't demand that of anyone else. I mean, if a WL Gore wanted to build a new plant, we wouldn't be asking them to subsidize mass transit. Or if a new Walmart went in, or if, the, if USGS was expanding their campus. So I am, you know, I'm not taking a position on this, but I'm saying there's two sides to this argument. Yes, I think the hospital has some responsibility to provide transportation, but the other side of that is we're not demanding that of anyone else. So let's keep that in perspective. I will be voting yes on this when it comes to that. Council, any other comments? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 
Any opposed? Respectfully, no. That motion carries. A resolution of the Flagstaff City Council amending the Flagstaff Regional Plan 2030 to change the place type designation within a future suburban activity center, S16, from neighborhood scale to regional scale on maps 21, 22, and 24. Move the center point of a future suburban activity center, S16, north and east on maps 21, 22, and 24. Change the area type designation on map 21 and 22 from area in white and existing rural slash future suburban to existing employment for approximately 28 acres and realign a future circulation road corridor on map 25, generally located at 1120 West Purple Sage Trail, providing for severability and establishing an effective date. Thank you. Council Member Salas. It is my honor to move to adopt resolution number 2022-56. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. That motion carries. Thank you. And it is time for a break. See you in 20 minutes.